with the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from uh, the life God give, gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. You get me? They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you've learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Show off your old, uh, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. It's, it's just perfect, isn't it? And, uh, which is, uh, sorry, I can't, can't really say that one. Oh, corrupted. <laughs> corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, that, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put your new nature created to be like God truly righteous and holy yes thank you so stop so stop telling lies let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all part of the same body and don't sin by letting anger control you don't let the sun go down while you are still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil if you are a thief quit stealing you don't have to be told that really do you I mean, instead use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. I'm still working on that. <laughs> that everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all your bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behaviour. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. I, I left school when I was 15, just, just a couple of years ago, not, not too long ago. And uh, to this day, I can still remember some of my teachers, and I can remember some of the things I was taught. I remember Mr. Lawson. Uh, I remember Miss, Miss Brown. I think I was her pet. Uh, I remember Mr. Rankin. I, re I remember their names, and, and I remember what they taught me as well. And the reason why I'm making reference to that is because in the passage of Scripture that uh, Suzanne read so wonderfully to us this morning, uh, it, it depicts uh, almost our Savior as a, as a teacher. He has taught us, you have not so learned about Christ this way. And, and we have been taught by Jesus, and we have been told about Jesus. And, and one of the things that Jesus has taught us is this, that when you become a Christian, it's a new life, isn't it? It's not a matter of turning over a new leaf when we become a Christian. It is getting a new life. And in Jesus Christ, we have got a new life. And what he has taught us to do is this, to put off the old life that we once lived and to embrace the new life. Hence, the thing that we've got on the screen here this morning. Rich came up with that for me. Uh, off with the old, and that should be on with the new rather than in with the new. And I didn't realize that he superimposed my face into that, <laughs> that guy with the jacket there. Now, incidentally, it might be a new jacket, but there's no way I would ever wear a jacket like that. All right, so where is Rich? So uh, it's off with the old, and it's on with the new. Forget about the jacket, okay? Uh, but that's what the Christian life, and that is what we've been taught by Christ, to say goodbye to the old life and to embrace a new life. I read in one of J. John books that when he became a Christian, he told his mother, and his mother said to him, John, you've been brainwashed. And his reply was, yes, mom, my brain 
has been washed. But if you knew what was going on in my brain, you would be glad that it was washed. And that's what the Christian life is all about. It's not just about turning over a new leaf. It's about getting a new life in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that this morning, it's my prayer that you might find new life in Christ Jesus. Now, from verse 25 onwards, the Apostle Paul begins to apply what he means. He illustrates for us how we can put off the old life and we can embrace the new life. But two things very quickly before I actually come to that. In that passage of Scripture that uh, Suzanne read for us, particularly from verse 25 onwards, we, we see the importance of personal responsibility. Now, Paul doesn't say, now, pray about that bad temper you've got. He doesn't say, pray about that gossiping spirit that you've got. No, he just says, put it off. In fact, I'm convinced, and this might sound very unspiritual, there are some things that God doesn't want us to pray about. He just wants us to do. So, don't pray about the fact that you tell lies. Stop doing it. <laughs> don't pray about the fact that you've got a, a, a bad temper. Well, I got it from my mother. You know, my mother had a bad temper, and I've got it as well. Hey, well, don't you do it then. Put it off. So, it talks about the importance of personal responsibility. And then... He highlights the importance of our relationships with one another because from verse 25 on to the end of the chapter, the emphasis is upon relationships in the body of Christ. We are meant to be a testimony to the world. We are meant to show this world that we are followers of Christ by how we relate to one another. I like the way one theologian put it uh, about the church. We're like a pack of porcupines. We come together, but in the process of coming together, we needle one another. Have you ever been needled by a Christian, Liam? You know, the last person you would expect that to happen to. We come together. Oh, we upset one another, and then we break up, and then eventually we come back together again. Of course, I know that would never be true of anybody here or in this church, but it's, it's the reality, isn't it? Oh, I love that piece of poetry. To, to dwell above with saints we love, that will be bliss and glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> and it is, isn't it? You really are a hard bunch to get on with, you know? <laughs> and they'll know we are Christians by our... Oh, dear. I hate some of those songs that we used to sing. Them. Oh. All right. How do we apply this? Off with the old, off with this old garbage associated with my former life and, <laughs> dear me, that's all putting that, you know. Uh, I, I just realized the other night, that's, that's, that's a picture of me there, you know. Uh, it makes me want to go on holiday, that does, when I, when I see that. On with the new. So how does, how does Paul apply this? First of all, he tells us to... Um, to put off lying and to embrace truth. Now, Jim, are you saying that a Christian could tell a porky? Oh, yes, yes. Have you ever met Christians who tell porkies? Oh, yes, yes. I'm trying not to look at anybody here as I'm, <laughs> as I'm talking. I have, met, I have met many Christians, and they, and they justify it by saying, well, it wasn't a black lie. It was only a white lie. I like the story of uh, a mother who said to uh, 
his son, she said, Johnny, do you know what a lie is? And the little boy had a, a moment of inspiration. Mother, a lie is, is an abomination to the Lord, but it is a never-present help in the time of need. <laughs> and it's characteristic of the world, isn't it? Lies. How do you know when a politician is telling lies? Every time his, his lips are moved, that's right. <laughs> it's characteristic of the world. Friends, it shouldn't be found in the church of Jesus. We are the followers of the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And guess what? One of the characteristics of God is that he is a God of truth. The nature of God, he, he is truth. And at conversion, we uh, have a new nature, and therefore, we should put off lies, and we should put on truth because it is a part of who God is. In fact, the Bible says it's impossible for God to tell a lie. And friends, for us, we should have truth in the ranks. Truth in the ranks. So important because we are members of the body of Christ. You can't tell and you can't trust people who lie. Can you? And, and my mother used to say, a liar has to have a good memory. I think that's true, don't they? <laughs> but I shouldn't even be talking like this in the body of Christ, but yet it's true. A lie is meant to deceive. And one of the first ways that we can put off the old man by way of illustration is put off lying and put on Truth. Is everybody feeling comfortable this morning? All right. We are. Good. Secondly, not only put off, I'm just trying to save some time here this morning, not only put off uh, lying and put on truth, uh, but put off on, on righteous anger and put on righteous anger. In those verses of Scripture, um, before us, hope I'm not off camera there. Uh, but what does what does Paul say there? He says, "In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry, and do not give the devil a foothold." Now there is there is such a thing as righteous anger, and once again, that is part of the nature of God. He he is a, a God who. We don't like to read verses of Scripture like this, but it says that God is angry every day with what goes on in this world, with the sin of this world. And I, I'm uh, thinking about the story of Jesus in Mark chapter 3, where he was there in the, in the synagogue, and the, the scribes and the Pharisees were just looking for an opportunity to say something about him because there was a man with a, a, a withered hand, and Jesus looking around, it says that he was angry. I have to tell you, friends, there's things that I get angry about. I, I get angry with, and, and maybe, and maybe we need to be careful, or maybe sometimes there's a fine line between righteous anger and sinful anger, because I talked once again to some Christian says, oh, I was full of righteous anger, and I said, I'm not too certain if your anger was too righteous or, or not, only, only God will judge the heart, you know. But, but oh, and, there's a, and sometimes there can be a fine line between it. Uh, and, and, but there is such a thing as, as righteous anger. And, you know, we have some great ministries in the body of Christ today because, because people got angry about things. We have the Salvation Army because William Booth got angry at the sight of seeing young children lying in the gutters, drunk. We have Teen Challenge today because a, a, an American 
I'll put this in, an Assemblies of God pastor got angry when he saw what drug addiction was doing to kids, and he, he started a teen ch- And it all started with a righteous anger. So we need to put on unrighteous or put off unrighteous anger and put on a righteous anger. But then, then Paul, he says here, uh, don't let the sun go down on your... But he says, beware, beware when you get angry. Beware when you get angry. People, people who fly off the fa- handle usually have a bad landing, by the way. Did you get that? You're a bit slow this morning, right? I, I thought that was profound, didn't you? Like, people, people who fly off the handle usually have a bad landing. And, and here Paul says, well, what is it? Well, somebody described anger as momentary insanity. <laughs> Woo, we just, well, my mother was like, well, don't you be like that. It's, it's part of the old nature. Part of the new nature is righteous anger. And Paul says here, don't let, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it and deal with it quickly. I, I like the way J.P. Philip translated. Don't let, the, don't let the cinders smolder. Deal with it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It just means deal with it quickly. I, um, a few years ago, I was in uh, I was in Iceland, beautiful, beautiful country. You had to be a millionaire to leave, live there, but I'll tell you that very expensive. Me and my son, we had an Icelandic beer and a and a couple of fish and chips and the sixty sixty pounds. <laughs> This, that was a few years. You must be millionaires live here. You must be. You must have very high wages, you know. But we were at that time when the sun didn't go down for three months. I think it was May, June, and July. And so it was funny sharing a room with my son, going to bed when the sun was shining, and getting up in the morning, and the, and the sun was still shining. And I said, well, if, if I was a Christian here living in Iceland, uh, how would I interpret that verse of Scripture, don't let the sun go down on your wrath? It means I can hold on from my bitterness for at least three months. You know? <laughs> of course, of course it doesn't mean that, does it? It means, it means just deal with it quickly. Don't let it smolder. Don't allow the devil, as it says here, get up foothold. And, and, and that's what has destroyed some churches. Anger has, has risen. It's not been dealt with quickly. And the devil gets his foot in. And he causes havoc. So, put off line. Off of the old. On with the new, put off lying, put on truth, put off sinful anger, put on righteous anger. I love how Paul illustrates this. And, and, and then he says here, he also says, um, put, off, put off stealing and put on sharing. <laughs> is there any, are you saying there's a, is there any thieves here this morning? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 just, I just love what the scriptures say. I, I'm, I'm a literalist. By that I mean I, I take the Bible as literally as I possibly can. It says, he who has been stealing uh, must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So he says, put off, put off stealing and, and, and put on, in contrast, part of the nature of God that he's so generous, put on sharing. Um, maybe um, Colin and Kathleen might, might know the name that I'm going to mention now. 
uh, there once was a, an evangelist in Ireland called W.P. Nicholson. I see them nodding their heads in, in, in agreement. Uh, he, was, he was referred to as the, as the tornado in the pulpit, uh, which would be a nice way to be referred to, the tornado in the pulpit. And he, he was a fiery evangelist for Jesus Christ. And um, he was used significantly by God uh, he, he passed away in 1959. Uh, I, I did hear one or two tapes of him preaching on one occasion, and I said, wow, people listening to him must have felt very uncomfortable. And, um, but he was, he was having, he was having a, 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 a couple of weeks of campaigns in the, in the city of my birth, Belfast, and the, the, the shipyard workers were coming along, uh, hearing W.P. Nicholson preach. And he was going through the Ten Commandments, etc. And, and before long, the, 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 the shipyard workers, where the Titanic was built, etc., uh, were so convicted that they began to take back to Harlem and Wolf stolen material. <laughs> to such an extent that they had to put a sign, Harlem and Wolf had to put a sign outside the shipyard and said, will all those who are attending the W.P. Nicholson's services please stop bringing back stolen goods? We have nowhere to store it. <laughs> we laugh, but isn't that a great story? Let them who steal, steal no longer. And in contrast, what do we do? We share. Ah, oh, wouldn't it be fabulous if the people in this community and in this town would know us as a people who are generous. Generous. That if we go out as a group of uh, Christians for a, a meal at Christmas time, that, that when it comes to tipping the... the the, the, the staff, that we're generous, that they'll see, wow, aren't those Christians, aren't they generous people? Generosity. And I'll tell you this, every time you are generous, you are sending a message back to that old sinful life that you once lived that you're not being dictated by the old life. You're sending a message to the old nature that I put on a new person. I'm being generous. Actually, Paul says here, he talks about something on three levels. He, he says that he may have something to share with those in need. You must work. Oh, it's a four-letter word, isn't it? Work. But he says, you must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So you can, you can steal to get. You can work to get. But then you can go to another level. You can work to get in order that you can give. I like, I think it was, I think it was John Stott and his commentary and uh, Ali made reference to it a couple of weeks ago. I think it, it was him who said, only Jesus can turn a burglar into a benefactor. <laughs> I like that. So, off with the old, uh, on with the new, put off Lying, put on truth. Put off sinful anger, put on righteous anger. Put off um, stealing and put on sharing. And then, and then fourthly, uh, once again, being tuned into this passage of Scripture here, uh, put, put off on unwholesome speech and put on helpful speech. Unwholesome speech put on helpful speech. Once again, he applies this throughout the passage, doesn't it? 
do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Incidentally, it's probably in this area more than any other area we show whether or not God has done a work of grace in our hearts, in our speech. What does he say? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who, who listen. Um, the word that is used here literally means rotten, rotten speech. And that, can, that could in, include, maybe, maybe includes things like borderline jokes. Hey, and you know, <laughs> a lot of you just know, uh, nobody likes a good joke more than me, right? Incidentally, my best jokes usually come from Ireland, and they're usually Irish jokes, but never mind. <laughs> uh, th I, I hope that never changes in this day of political correctness, that we don't still have the ability. I, I, told, I told my uh, house group, uh, did you hear the joke about the, the, the Irish woodworm, you know? It was, it was found dead in a brick. No. <laughs> okay. But we, you know what? We got the ability to laugh at ourselves. Oh, don't take yourself. You liked that one, didn't you, Peter? I know you did. You nearly fell off your seat when I told that one. Like, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Let me, I'll, and I'll tell you something else. In my darkest days, the thing that kept me going at times was laughter, was a good joke. Only fools and horses was a lifesaver for me. You plonker, Rodney. <laughs> you dipstick, you know. It, it, was, it was my savior at times, laughter. So nothing wrong with jokes, but hey, we've got to be careful about the borderline jokes, haven't we? Unwholesome talk, criticism, Um, cynicism, oh, you know what I've asked God to save me from as I get older? Please, Lord, help me not to be cynical. But you know what? I have to admit, I still drift into it from time to time. And I don't want to. And so, Jim, when I'm doing it, Jim, put it off. And put on things that are help. You know, being critical, we, being critical about other Christians in front, in front of Christians, is that helpful? Is that helpful? Rotten, putrid communication, speech. You know, speech is such a wonderful thing. You know, the, the cows moo and, and horses neigh and dogs bark, but, but people speak. I was teaching my, um, I was teaching my, my grandson a little bit of Spanish uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was trying to impress him, and I said, I said, Jonah, he's, he's five at time. This is uh, in Spanish, mesa, mesa, mesa. And, uh, and then I was pointing to other things, you know, cat, uh, cat, gato, gato, gato. And then I said to him, and Jonah, and he was listening, he said, do you, do, you, do you know what the Spanish word for dog is? And he looked at me, he went, Woof, woof. <laughs> don't you just love, don't you just love kids have the things they come out with, you know, woof, woof. <laughs> oh, but on a more serious point, <laughs> let's watch our language. Let's watch our speech. Let's be certain that the things that we say are going to build people up. Off with the old and on with the new, and speak into the people's lives something that's going to bless them, that's going to build them up, that's going to make them better Christian. Because to, I, I could take you to many people, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about a dear friend who's down in, in uh, rugby. He's, he's, he's 84 now. He's 84 now, and he's still suffers as a result of something that was said to him something like 60 years ago. Last point, almost finished. Yeah, oh my goodness. 
Timekeeper, how am I doing? All right. Okay. Oh, I'm over time. All right. The last point is, he says here, put off, uh, where am I? Yeah, he says, put off bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. This is not very nice stuff, is it? And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in, just as in Christ God forgave you. So put all that garbage off and put on the new stuff. So the, the, the summing up the message this morning, very simply, is off of the old and on with the new. And I tell you, I conclude with this story. If you were out in your garden and you were working away, if you're a gardener, the Lord bless you, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but it's a hot, sunny day. You're out in the garden, cutting the grass, digging away, and you get hot and sweaty. And then you go, uh, you, you go and you have a shower. You take off all those dirty clothes. You put them aside. You get into your shower. You get lovely and clean. Uh, and, and then you dry yourself down. Now, if you were me, you wouldn't get back into those old clothes again, would you? You get into some nice, clean, beautiful clothes. And we have been cleansed. We have been forgiven. Now we need to put on clothes that are consistent with the cleansing that we have received in Jesus Christ. Off with the old. On with the new, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.